Thank you very much, Dr. Thomas, and thanks to uh, the organizers of Forum 2008 uh, for this opportunity to come here and interact with you all. Uh, I think uh, cough is such a nasty problem that uh, at the end of 40 years of practice, I do not know how to control cough in a given child. <laughs> and even then, the best thing is, finally, uh, whatever happens, the cough stops. Uh, and then I wonder, what was the last medicine I prescribed that cured the child? And next time when he comes again, that medicine doesn't work. <laughs> so I tell the parents, it's the last medicine that works, which I can't give first, and therefore you will have to wait and let the cough pass by itself. <laughs> and I think that's the story of cough. And I'm sure all of us know how difficult it is to control cough, though the best is almost nobody dies of cough. And that's the worst part for a physician because he keeps on coming again and again. And he expects you to do something different and nothing different works either. And I think from that point of view, I'll just take you through a core knowledge of what cough means. Uh, what is the basic information that we all need to uh, digest? And then take through uh, how we apply all that basic knowledge to common conditions that we all see in day-to-day -day practice. I think uh, you know that cough is a protective reflex. I think uh, if, if a human being was not to cough, then there would be a lot of trouble. Because if something is irritating the airway, then the nature would see that that irritant has to be thrown out. And the only way to attempt to throw it out is to cough. And therefore, whenever a child coughs, it means that it is doing some good purpose behind it. All the same, we want to stop that nuisance. And I think it's like a pain. Uh, if you get a fracture and if you never had a pain, then you would keep on walking and maybe decide to go to your doctor next day and break your bone thoroughly further. Just because you had pain, you stopped even standing and rushed to a doctor. So many times all these uh, so-called nuisance of symptoms are very protective. And we know that it results from some irritation of the airways. I think it's important to realize that the cough is a symptom of an airway involvement and not the lung parenchyma involvement, not a pleural involvement. And the point that I want to make is therefore that pneumonias may not cough badly. And I think that's something that we need to recall. When somebody coughs badly, it's an airway disease. And all of us have learned in undergraduate days that anything happening in the tube or a lumen is either inside the lumen, inside the wall or outside the wall. And exactly that's what happens when you start coughing. We know that the airway is largely divided into an upper and lower airway. And in an upper way you have a dry cough and in a lower way you have often a wet cough. Though we know that a small child cannot cough effectively and therefore has a very noisy cough and a breathing but cannot expect or it and looks like almost a dry cough. And we know that a child with asthma who has got a narrowed airway and a very thick viscid mucus cannot really bring out anything and the so-called lower airway cough looks a dry cough. And I think to that extent uh, we also know that if a larger airways are involved you have a cough as a very predominant symptom. The point to take home therefore is, if, if a child comes to you with a cough as a predominant main <coughs> symptom and a cough is severe, then it's a larger airway, right from maybe the upper airway to bronchi, but as you go past that to bronchioles or to a lung parenchyma and alveoli, the cough gets less and less severe. And therefore, more the severe cough, more is the chance that it's a larger airway involvement. And I think the point that I want to make here is that, that a simple chest x-ray is useless for an airway disease. And in other words, one who coughs badly rarely requires a chest x-ray. And often one who may not be coughing badly might need a chest x-ray. And it's very common, I'm sure all of us have seen that, parents come and say, there is so much of cough but Dr. Chest x-ray is normal. Look at the chest x-ray does not reveal much of airway as much as it relieves the light. It shows the lung parenchyma, and therefore I think this is important for all of us to understand. Let's go back to our basics that we learned way back in undergraduate days, and therefore we know that cough indicates a respiratory involvement, 
severe and significant cough is an airway disease. Mild cough is a feature of a lung parenchyma pleura or an interstitial. And therefore, to repeat again, when you have a cough as a predominant major symptom and a severe symptom, you are looking at an airway. The moment you know that you are looking at an airway, then you localize the anatomy of the disease. I think in clinical practice, the most important is to first localize the site of disease. And that's how, look at our undergraduate curriculum. We learned anatomy first, then the pathology, and then the clinical medicine. I think the clinical application in routine practice exactly goes the same way. That unless I know the anatomy of the disease, is it a upper airway or a lower airway? And I think it could be both, upper and lower airway. And I think then I know that if it's the anatomy is localized, then I look at the accompanying symptoms, and you know that fever almost always indicates acute infection. What is more important is, no fever is no acute infection. And therefore, never consider infection in an acute symptomatology without fever. Exceptions are there in clinical medicine, and those exceptions may be a neonate or immunocompromised patient, etc., but that is not a part of our routine clinical practice. And therefore, if a child of an acute onset of cough has no fever, your antibiotic is out. Not that fever means an antibiotic, and we'll take it further, but no fever, no antibiotic. And I think even if you just take that message home, uh, we will do far more rationality. And to that extent, uh, we know that uh, acute onset of high fever suggests either bacterial or viral infection. Absence of fever rules out infection. And I think uh, we know that mild fever or low-grade fever needs confirmation. Many parents would say, oh, the forehead looks a little warm than the rest of the body. Now, these are all normal physiological changes that occur in small children. And therefore, whenever you are uh, told about a mild fever, it could be no fever as well. And I think it's much important to document that. How do you clinically approach a child of cough? When you therefore confirm that cough is the chief complaint, we all recall in undergraduate days that we were told about a chief complaint and then origin duration progress. The chief complaint was not the complaint by your chief, <laughs> but the chief complaint was the parent. Parents have many complaints. And here is a child who says, uh, the parent says, uh, my child has a fever and a cold and a cough and a breathlessness and he's not eating and he's not sleeping and he's irritable. Now you want to know what's the chief complaint. And it's so important because that chief complaint tells you where you start from. And if the chief complaint is cough, and that's what we are discussing today, and then the mother says, of course there is fever also, and there may be a cold also. But the main complaint is cough. Confirm that because if a child has a major complaint as fever, and then say, doctor, also he coughs, oh, it may be a pneumonia. But if a mother said, oh, the child has been coughing badly and also has some fever, oh, you are on an airway disease. It's so important, and you can recall how we have been taught uh, up in an undergraduate days on chief complaint. The complaint may be similar, but the chief complaint may be different. A pneumonia chief complaint is fever or breathlessness or grunting or sickness. And a child who has got a mere bronchitis of any kind or say asthma, the major complaint is cough and not fever. So once you confirm that, keep in mind that in early infancy, cough is a serious problem. And we need not go into details of what serious it means. I think a good clinician should be able to pick up a serious problem and leave it to somebody who can take care of it because nobody can take care of it really. Yeah, so best way is to send it to somebody at the end of all that he may not understand why that small baby is coughing. But your job is to filter first what may be serious and what may need a lot of investigations. And I think if it's a, a child that say at three months or four months with a bad cough, take it as something underlying serious and it may be just enough to say, oh, this cannot be just taken lightly. Look at the origin. We have been taught that after chief complaint, we talk about origin, duration, progress. And I think if you follow an undergraduate way, you will never miss a boat. And if it's a sudden onset cough, 
you know that it's an inhale foreign body. So here is a mother who said, now I know when you ask me when did the cough start and how did it start. Now for a mother, the cough is bothering her and the child may be coughing for the last two weeks. But when you asked her, tell me when did the cough start and how did it start? Oh, now she would recall, said, yes, I recall now that he was quite all right and suddenly I heard him starting to cough. A sudden onset of cough is often an inhaled body, foreign body or an allergy. I think in clinical medicine, what starts suddenly is either trauma, physical, inhaled foreign body is a physical, or allergy, I suddenly get urticaria, sudden, or a vascular, I suddenly get a pain in chest, or maybe neurological, I suddenly get an epileptic fit, but infection don't happen suddenly. So how easy to get to the origin and say, how sudden this happened? And if the cough happens suddenly, then I know that it's probably uh, an inhaled foreign body uh, or maybe an allergy. And if these four conditions, the physical, allergy, vascular or neurogenic appear suddenly, then few of them may disappear suddenly. Allergy may disappear suddenly. A mother phones and say, my child has a sudden severe urticaria and swelling of the lips and eyes and by the time he comes to you, there is no swelling at all. Sudden appearance and sudden disappearance may be allergy, vascular, neurogenic, but not physical. Therefore, this child has a cough which appears suddenly and would not disappear is an inner foreign body, just by the history. And then, of course, if you have a gradual onset, and therefore, if a child comes to me with two weeks of cough, and I say, no, tell me, how did it start? Oh, it started very innocuously, very benign. First two, three days, there was not much of cough, but the cough went on worsening. So I know that it's likely to be an infection maybe. And I think that is how the origin is so important. And then of course duration. Short duration cough is often an acute infection, whereas a long duration cough may be a chronic infection or an allergy. Oh, doctor is coughing for so long time now. A bacterial infection is unlikely. Viral infections also are ruled out. Chronic infection may be or an allergy. So duration. And then of course the progress. For my child started cough, it was not very severe, it went on increasing, but at the end of a week or two, doctor, it's terrible. Gradually worsening cough is probably a pertussis or maybe a recurrent cough in asthma or a recurrent infection. And therefore, what we are rehearsing is what we learnt in undergraduate days, a chief complaint, the origin, the duration, the progress. And I think it's very important to realize that as, as you go on uh, collecting more experience, you come to learn that the basics cannot be forgotten. And I recall that once a cow was shown to an intern who had just passed MBBS last week and asked, what is this animal? The intern looked at me and said, what are you asking what this animal? This is simply a cow. I said, any difference in diagnosis? He said, no, nothing. Simply cow. He was so sure. The same th animal was shown to an MD. I said, what is this? He said, looks like cow, but you need to investigate. <laughs> because he has seen animals like cow looking, you know, yeah. So he's not sure. That means he has experience. Okay, and then it was shown to a DM, a super specialist. And he said, what is this? He said, oh, that, there could be many. I said, oh, what is this? He said, this may be an atrophied elephant. <laughs> Oh, I, I recall having seen once. Oh, it could be. What about what else? Oh, it could be a hypertrophic goat. Ah. Then I said, what about cow? He said, yeah, that also needs to be ruled out. <laughs> the point is that you need to think like an undergraduate and you make less mistakes. Well, as an undergraduate, you would miss an atrophied elephant and a hypertrophic goat. But he will never meet those anyway. And he would miss a cow otherwise if we thought of those. And I think therefore all that we are trying to make a clinical approach is simply go back to what you learn when you did not know anything. And you continue to use the same even if you knew a lot thereafter. And I think that is what this slide really makes it. And then of course accompanying symptoms, we said fever indicates infection, breathlessness may be a pneumonia or an asthma. And I think this is on the history. Now you look at a patient. You have a nasal discharge or a blocked nose. Well, 
I think you know, almost always a viral infection or an allergy. And then you have an accompanying diarrhea. What does this mean? That the common viral infections are disseminated infections. They are not localized. An acute tonsillitis does not run the nose nor has anything in the chest. But a common viral respiratory infection has a congested eyes, congested nose, running nose, blocked nose, cough, pharyngitis, tonsillitis, bronchitis, disseminate. And the viral infection may even disseminate into a GI tract and has diarrhea. And I think that is how you diagnose simply an infection. So how do, how do I diagnose in routine clinical practice a bacterial versus a viral infection? Bacterial infection is localized. Viral infection is generalized. Does a blood count help? Not at all. Even in an acute viral infection, you get a polymorph nuclear leukocytosis. That is no criteria to differentiate the two, but the history of a disseminated lesion plus a viral infection spread from one to another. So simple question, who else in your family is suffering? Oh doctor, the whole family, one after another is having fever, cold, cough. Oh, you don't need to see a child. You know it's a viral infection. Tonsillitis and pneumonia don't come saying, oh, every one of us has had pneumonia in the last one month now. And in, therefore, I think those simple things work. Past history of similar cough, of course, family history of atopy or contact with viral infection, as I said, or TB. And of course, the birth history. This is important because all preterm born children or an IUGR, small birth weight problem, uh, or those who have had a neonatal lung problem, like they had a meconium aspiration or whatever, these babies are likely to keep on getting recurrent cough in the first one or two years. And it's a benign thing. And it will disappear over time. This is because that they were either born with immature anatomical or physiological respiratory tract and it got damaged very early and therefore it has a, what is known as a hyper-responsiveness. And it dies out over time. And I think that's why it's, it's important to look at that. And then, of course, you look at the child, whether it's febrile or febrile. We said an febrile cough is rarely an infective cough of an acute dancer. And then you look at whether he's a sick or not sick. Children with acute bacterial infections look sick. But children with acute viral infection look sick only at the peak of fever. And the moment the fever is down, even by a degree or two, Oh, the child is playing. And how simple then is the difference between viral and bacterial infection? You ask the mother of a child of pneumonia, oh, even when the fever comes down, doctor, I don't like this child's behavior. He's lethargic, he's irritable, he's sick, he's groaning. And look at the child of a viral infection with 104 fever. Oh, doctor, the moment the paracetamol is given, the fever comes down. Oh, he, he's all over. He's normal. I think that speaks of a common viral versus bacterial infection. And then, of course, in the respiratory tract, you also hear the respiration. And if you hear a strider, you know that there is an upper airway inspiratory obstruction, like... <coughs> you know that there is an upper airway inspiratory obstruction, and the lesion would be probably somewhere in the larynx. And then if you have a child with a grunt, which almost means a pneumonia... <coughs> that's a grunt. That's a pneumonia, till proved otherwise. And then, of course, a wheeze that all of us know uh, as a as clinical sign of an expiratory, maybe even inspiratory obstruction of a lower airway. And I think the noise that a breathing makes, a respiration makes, make you a diagnosis. And then I've already said, uh, sir, we are not sure whether it's a bronchial breathing or not. I'm sure many students don't, because they have never tried to hear vesicular breathing hundred times. And what does not look vesicular may be bronchial. Uh, but we haven't practiced a vesicular breathing. It does not matter. Even if you know whether the signs are all over the chest or only in one area, I think diagnosis is made. Forget the impaired note and increased TVF, increased VR. That all we did to pass exam. Thereafter, we, all that we need to know is signs are all over the chest. Either it's a viral infection or an asthma. And if the signs are only in one area of the chest, oh, it may be mostly a pneumonia. Well, there are exceptions to all this, but yes, these are a simple screening tests. This does not mean that you don't master a clinical examination, but many of us can do even without it. This is not to perpetuate no physical examination, but also to know that the worst physical examiner also can make a lot out of simple 
uh, application of mind. And I think that is how, but if it's a localized sign, then you know that this may be a bacterial infection. Having given all this uh, baseline information, I, I will take you quickly through actual live cases, and we will apply all this knowledge to each case and get a take-home message of how we apply this basic core knowledge. Now, this was the two-year-old child with recurrent cough and fever for a year. Now, this parent are going every now and then for the same symptom, onset with fever, followed by cold and cough. Fever remits within three days, but the cough worsens. Now, this is a very common story. And then you ask the mother, how does the fever start? Oh, it starts as a high fever. Anything that starts with high fever often is a viral infection. A typical bacterial infection starts with mild, moderate fever and becomes very high by day three, day four. And most of the viral infection by day three, day four are getting better. So a good clinician can diagnose a cause of fever on day three, day four and not on day one, day two. Okay, so do not make a mistake of making a great diagnosis on first hour of fever. And to that extent, all that you want to see in the first one or two days of fever is that child is not very sick and is not likely to be a high risk situation. Otherwise, you know that this fever disappeared in three days, but the cough worsened. What did an average practitioner do? Start with an antibiotic on day one, and by day four change the antibiotic, because the cough is worse. Okay, the fever has disappeared, the cough, is, the cough lasts for a long time, antibiotic failed, recurrence every month, but normal in between. This is typically a story of a weak associated respiratory viral infection. Why do you call it infection? Because of fever. Why do you call it viral infection? Fever disappeared in three days. Why did the cough last for two weeks? Because there is a weak associated bronchitis with viral infection. There are many children who have a, what is known as a hyperreactive airway. This could be even genetic or hereditary. And a simple viral infection disappears in two three days time, but uh, it excites a cough that goes on for two weeks. All that you want is a reassured parents and no specific therapy at all. I think when you give a prescription of multiple drugs, the parent don't ask you questions. But when you say don't give a drug, they ask you many questions. And every time when I say, oh, there is no drug for this, they have hundreds of questions. And I ask them, why did you not ask a doctor who gave five drugs? He said, no, but he's a doctor. No, you can't ask him. Then, Am I not a doctor or what? So, uh, yeah, that means they, are, they expect you to write something. And if you write anything, they are happy. What a trust in a doctor. Whatever he writes must be right. But if he cannot write, then you are, your neighbor says, oh, he doesn't know medicines at all. No, how can he write? You know, so, uh, he only talks and doesn't write. And many times you are not paid for talking. You are paid for writing and making them spend more outside with the chemist. So, uh, but I think here is the reassurance. And it's important to reassure them that this will go on for two weeks. I tell the parent that if you had a fracture and a millionaire had a fracture, even then he sat in a plaster for two, three months. Even if you got an imported plaster, it took two, three months. So, some of the illness take time and you cannot just speed them up in recovery because these are all self-limiting condition and here therefore you won't ask for a blood count, a chest x-ray. Normally if the cough lasts for two weeks you would say, let's rule out TB. What TB? TB doesn't start with high fever of this kind. TB doesn't end up with high fever in three days. And therefore it's enough to say, this child should not be investigated. If you investigate, you will find something wrong with the laboratory test, not with the child. <laughs> And I, I always ask the parent, but why was he investigated? He said, no, he was investigated because we didn't know what it was. Now, if you have not lost anything in your house, but if you lodge a complaint with the police, police don't ask you whether you are really lost. They start searching a thief. And they also catch a thief. <laughs> and after they caught the thief, you look in your house and say, thief has been caught, I must have lost something in my house, let's start searching the house. <laughs> we almost do that in clinical medicine, that we first get a manto positive, you get a chest x-ray with query hyler, and you say, must be TB, where is TB, let's search all over. And we do find them, because we search and we find. And to that extent, I think a good clinician should ask for a test only when he suspects. Because the laboratory man feels he has a tremendous faith in your clinical judgment. 
So when you have asked for a test, he thinks there must be something wrong. And a radiologist is obliged to find what is wrong. He does not know that there is something wrong with me only. What x-ray? Okay, and therefore, a radiologist will finally say, query higher. That means he puts a query. You can't tell a parent, this is query TB, and you take query treatment. And therefore, uh, you, are, you are back into trouble. And the worst is the radiologist and the laboratory people today right below, uh, clinically correlate. You don't have to tell me what, you radiologically correlate. Okay, but I'm sure all of us, uh, in Chennai they must be writing the same, I'm sure. That, yeah, correlate clinically. That means he's telling us, examine properly. So I, I think this was uh, simply that. And now this is a two-year-old child, similar story. Similar story like the first child, but look at the difference. Onset with high fever, nasal discharge, cough. Everything settles down with antibiotics. Recurrence every month, never normal in between. Why is not normal in between? He's mouth breathing, he has a dribbling of saliva, he's snoring, he has an adenoid facies. This is different than the first fellow, who got well within three days, but the cough persisted. This child got well within three days with an antibiotic, everything disappeared, but everything recurred again. And this is typically a recurrent bacterial upper respiratory infection. What's the message here? If you got a second episode of a recurrent bacterial infection, then there is something wrong with the child. Nobody gets repeated bacterial infection, but every child gets repeated viral infection. It's so important to differentiate recurrent infection from viral and bacterial, because if it's a bacterial, you don't give every time a new antibiotic. You in fact investigate the child, and this child has obviously an enlarged adenoid, he's a mouth breather, he's snoring, and he has got therefore a recurrent infection of an adenoid which holds on the focus and therefore needs much treatment. This is a bigger child with a recurrent cough fever for three years. Again, similar story like the previous two-year-old child. And now you find that he has got a foul breath. Again, he has got a persistent nasal discharge. So this is a child of a chronic sinusitis. And what is sinusitis? At one stage, as pediatrician, we thought that we don't see sinusitis, but today we know that sinusitis does occur even in children, and uh, the best way to suspect sinusitis is a persistent nasal discharge, often uh, thick, or uh, maybe greenish, maybe foul-smelling breath, and I think that may be a sinusitis. What is important of these bacterial infection? A focus remains in an adenoid or a tonsil or a sinus, and with a five or seven days of antibiotic, the focus doesn't get eradicated and again resurfaces and the patient comes to you again and again with a similar story. And therefore, take a message here is recurrent viral respiratory infections are common in toddlers, recover without antibiotic, does not affect health and does not need any laboratory test. Just now we had a discussion what's the right age to go to school and today you are in a school right from birth if you like and then you are in a pool of infection. What is the definition of a normal child to a pediatrician today? One who gets recurrent viral infection because he's thrown into a pool of infection. One who is stressed all the time. And one who is harassed by the mother, force fed, and therefore never eats. He's a normal child. Yeah, with an abnormal parental attitude, of course. That's what Krav Padmati was talking about, I'm sure that. And therefore, if a mother comes and says, my child obeys me, three-year-old. Oh, three-year-old obeys you, what's wrong with him? Uh, uh, and he eats well, he eats well, or there's something wrong with him. So, pathology. Physiology is don't obey the parents and don't eat. And ask for something which they say no. So that's a normal child. But I'm sure the adults have to be normal and know how to behave with this so-called normal child. So, I think uh, recurrent bacterial infections always have a background cause. And I think repeated antibiotic is not an answer. And if you prescribe antibiotic for a similar illness within a short time, evaluate the problem. So you can't say, oh, I've been treating a recurrent tonsillitis every month. No, you have to do something beyond. And I think no prescription of another antibiotic quickly. This was an eight-year-old child uh, with present in cough for last six weeks. Okay, worsened over the next few days. Mild fever at the onset. Look at this child, no fever as a main complaint. So probably he may not have an infection at all or he has an infection that is not going to cause fever and this child has no past history of similar cough. So he's not a child who is known to be coughing. What does it mean? 
any child who comes to you for coughing first says, has he been always getting this problem? And many children would be in that bracket. This child did not do that. History of similar cough in the father and unnecessarily investigated, but this is typically a pertussis. Uh, pertussis in older children do not even hoop. And therefore the word hooping cough is only for small children. Adults who cough because of pertussis don't hoop. And they just cough. So if a healthy adult or a healthy 8 year old who has never had much of cough in the past suddenly starts coughing and goes on coughing for the next 6 weeks, I know that this may be a pertussis as well. And this is a 4 year old child who presents with mild fever again, cough for last 3 weeks, no past history of similar illness, not gaining weight for last few months. Now this is a child again with mild fever and a cough for last 3 weeks. Recent onset of fever and cough for 2 or 3 weeks or longer might mean a search for TB in our community. And recent onset of fever and cough for more than 2-3 weeks. Not a recurrent cough. The recurrent cough in between the child is alright, is unlikely TB. And therefore this child typically has a TB. Uh, today we know that uh, tuberculosis can be proved very often. Uh, and it could be proved with a gastric lavage. Not a bad idea. Somebody who is uh, to be labelled as TB and put on 6-9 months of treatment might deserve a confirmation. And I recall Dr. Miller who wrote a book on pediatric TB visiting India in the 80s. And then he asked us, oh but you don't see ALP in TB? I said, no, we can diagnose even without them. Okay. So, uh, because uh, we all diagnose TB without looking at ALP. And I think uh, uh, this is the child with a big lesion there. This is one indication of doing an x-ray. We said that a child who coughs badly rarely needs an x-ray. This child has got a recent onset of fever and cough for three weeks. And this is another one, two-year-old, sudden onset of severe cough. I said that he is not, not febrile, he is not safe, and he had a sudden onset. And he showed a left upper lobe. Sorry for this x-ray, has not come out well. But this is a left upper lobe uh, uh, emphysema, and this was a foreign body. Another indication of a chest x-ray in a child with cough. So we have two indications for chest x-ray. Uh, laboratory tests are of limited value in case of cough. Eosinophilia is very non-specific. Uh, at the end of 40 years of clinical practice, I have not seen a single child with tropical eosinophilia, and I have never given dietyl carbamazine citrate, which only means I have missed all of them, or none of them have tropical eosinophilia. Only one of the two. Uh, uh, and same way there for uh, chest x-ray. Chest x-ray, more you cough, lesser you ask for a chest x-ray. And an exception is foreign body. How do you pick it up? Sudden onset of a cough in an febrile child and a not sick child and at an age where he can take in a foreign body. And generally therefore after 8-9 months of age when he develops a pincer grass and can pick up a thing. And I think this is what we take him. And then lastly, a 3 year old uh, who comes with a recurrent cough. This is very, very common. Today, asthma is very common all over the country. And I think that is one way we know that India is progressing. Because asthma is a disease of affluence. And what is this disease of affluence? Yes, heredity is there. But you have a nice environment which has a closed uh, ventilation, an air conditioner if you like. You have a carpet. You have a smoking parent. You have a cat and dog if you like. You have a flowers and a pollen. And therefore, you have all the material that you have a heredity and you start coughing. Asthma is very common. 10-15% of children may have an asthma in India, maybe 25-30% in the West. And therefore, it's not a disease of bad pollution. Oh, outside there is so much of pollution. Ask the parent what, what time of the day or night this child coughs. This child coughs at middle of the night or early morning. Not Nothing to do with outside environment. Well, pollution is there, outside pollution is there, automobile exhausts are there, but even then he coughs only at night when he has no contact with any of that. It is therefore easy to diagnose asthma. A febrile, not sick, episodic, episodes of cough. The parents would say, doctor, whole night is coughing, but how was the day? Doctor, surprisingly, the day he doesn't cough at all. Oh, no TB, no pneumonia, no nothing. TB doesn't come after the sunset and disappears on sunrise. Yeah, asthma does. And therefore, episodic, nocturnal. Ask this uh, parent, what happens when he runs? Oh, when he runs, he cries, he coughs. An infection don't do that. 
So of a brain, episodic, nocturnal, worsened by exertion, that is my asthma. Call it by the term asthma, don't call it bronchitis. I'm sure many of us call TB as Cox. Robert Cox invented, but he didn't want the tuberculosis to be called by his name. He had a better name. And therefore, uh, why hide from that and say, oh, he has Cox. Okay, same way, he has bronchitis. Those who wish badly tell me, oh, doctor has said this is not asthma, this is only bronchitis, allergy. Okay, we use all the term. I think asthma is a term that you need to counsel and explain that this is what it is and it could be well treated. I think we know it's a chronic inflammatory disease. I won't go into all these details, but all, all that I want to say is that this kind of cough is very, very common today. And not every asthma wheezes, yes, and not every wheezing child has an asthma. And we know that very, very well. But this is one common cause of asthma. Now, people call it a childhood asthma. What is childhood asthma? Uh, it's asthma-like syndrome which disappears as the age advances. That's why many times you and me tell the parent, oh, when he'll be five-year-old, he'll be all right. He should ask you, are you an astrologer or a doctor? So, how did you know at five years you'll be all right? What it means is, it will take a long time. But then, after fifth birthday, they come coughing and say, Doctor, you said five years and he's now one day past five years and still coughing. So, then some of us say, it might take ten years. Okay. And as pediatricians, we say, it might be throughout childhood because then adult physicians can take over. So, uh, the point is, we, we don't have to speculate when it will disappear, but the trend. And when I see a four-year-old who is coughing badly like this, and I say, oh, looks like asthma, but I have no history of allergy, atopy, no family history. And then, is it really an asthma or an asthma-like hyperreactive airway? All that I ask is, what's the trend? Now, this four-year-old child who comes to me with a cough like that, the mother said it started at two years. First year was very bad, but last six months are not so bad. He's now getting better. Oh, I know that this is not the true asthma. Also, there is no family history of allergy atopy. There is no personal history of atopy. And I think the trend, and as we said, the progress of condition, and I think uh, treatment, of course, today is an inhaler. We won't go into those details. But it is enough to say that cough syrups are not effective. Now, when you have a child with cough, what do you prescribe then? Cough syrups are not effective. You can't prescribe an anti-diarrheal. And Malti said no anti-diarrheal also. Then what do we do? Uh, and just now, Dr. Nadi said, it's not just paracetamol, one tablet for fever, you know, the complicated issues. So, then what do you prescribe? And I think, therefore, uh, your prescription is a counseling more than a drug prescription. And I think uh, some of us are very lucky that we don't have large practice. And because I don't have large practice, I can spend more time with each patient. Because if I go home early, my wife says, all your colleagues are so busy and you come home early. So, uh, so I have to go home late and then I have to spend more time with a patient. So counseling. Okay. Inevitably the fallout is a better counseling. Many of you are many of you are very busy. You have no time to counsel. So shortcut drugs and go away. That's that will not work in a cough. And therefore cough syrups are not important. But yes, there is a place to use a cough syrup. And what's the place? Just to relieve discomfort. And therefore you need to ask the parent. I can't relieve your child's cough, but I will relieve his discomfort. And what is the discomfort of the child? The mother is always at discomfort. You are not treating the mother's discomfort, child's discomfort. So you need to tell, to tell the mother what discomfort means. To a small infant, a discomfort means inability to sleep well, play well and feed well. No doctor he does all that well, but he is coughing, then don't treat him. Because the discomfort can be measured like this. And I think then only you could use maybe an antihistamine or a cough suppressor, SOS, not three times a day for five days. That is never a prescription. Mucolytics are useless. I remember when the first mucolytic came in, it said that uh, it clears the respiratory tract like a broom. Oh, it did not do that. Okay. And thereafter, mucolytic drops also came in for a newborn. You can't give a mucolytic to a fetus, I suppose. Therefore, they have right from newborn. And then there is an IV mucolytic also. In case you can't breathe well, you can take an IV as well. So mucolytics are useless. And I think largely, therefore, uh, all, the, all that I would uh, end up with, that many coughs are chronic or recurrent, persistent. And I think just follow this, that 
if recurrent cough has fever, it's either viral or bacterial, and I've already said how to differentiate that. And then if it is no fever but recurrent, it's often an asthma or a typically a small preterm baby who will get better over time. And if it's a persistent, or you might look at a chronic infection like pertussis or TB, foreign body, or chronic heart disease. Friends, all that I told you is that uh, treating cough is not easy, but diagnosing the cause of cough is not difficult. And then if a diagnosis is known, but the treatment is not easy, the only treatment is good counseling. And I think uh, once you develop that kind of a confidence, and I'm sure that a counseling, uh, the parents should see a confident doctor. Uh, even if, I, if I'm asked, oh, but no drug, I said there is no drug on earth which will cure your child, but I know your child will be all right. I think they get the confidence, and therefore all that I want you to practice is practice rationality as you get confident. Uh, many times I'm asked, sir, you are a senior, so you can counsel and say no drug. If you have not habituated to doing that right from your early time, you get used to writing drugs even at your old age. Counseling is not learnt at old age, it is learnt in the beginning of the thing. And I'm sure most of you must be following that. Thank you very much for your time. Humorous talk, which kept us all laughing, but kept us informed as well and took us to the very basics of medicine. Thank you for your interesting talk, sir. Uh, now, we are going to have a question-answer session because we have a little time. And if any of you have questions, you can just send it to the front. The first question, a child with post-tussive vomiting, does the child need a cough syrup or does the child need an anti-emetic? Well, I think anti-emetic will never work. So largely, if it's a cough-induced vomiting, uh, then especially in a smaller the child, this is the way a child ends up. Not much coughing, but vomiting. And I think many times the parents would say, he brings out a lot of mucus in his cough. It's a mucus from his stomach and not from his cough. And therefore, I think post tussive vomiting only tells you that the cough is very severe and no more information. And again back to say that you would try to give comfort to the child. For example, if you have a pertussis and a cough-induced vomiting, I will try to suppress cough if possible but not suppress vomiting because vomiting is the result of cough and you can't suppress vomiting if the cough is bad. And if I try cough suppression like dextromethorphan or falcodin, I think all of us know and I think that was the wisdom of older generation family physicians. They would concoct a specific recipe for an individual child. Today we have a ready-made bottle, one common for all. Naturally it doesn't work equally well for all. And I think you will have to decide. But tell the parent that you will try your best, but it's not going to be easy to suppress cough, but the cough will not trouble. And again, I think the treatment is less successful, but it's more acceptable if you counsel the parents correctly. The next question, sir. Are we seeing the re-emergence of pertussis? Is pertussis common? Has it not been eradicated yet? I think pertussis is probably seen in older children and adults too, but is often difficult to diagnose. How do you diagnose pertussis on a day-to-day -day routine clinical judgment? A person who is healthy has never had a cough much before, so he's not asthmatic, and he suddenly starts coughing, and a week later, his cough gets worse. And there is a similar story in a contact. I think his pertussis is still proved otherwise. And to that extent, pertussis does occur even in older children and adults. And that's one reason why there could be a need now of a pertussis vaccine, even at adolescents or young adults. And now we have a similar uh, safe product for using uh, even in adolescents or adults. And I'm sure an IIP National Committee looked at that and considered that as a probable need over time to immunize uh, even adolescents with pertussis vaccine. So it does apply. The third question, sir. The relevance of a raised total Ig, its significance and its involvement in management in the setting of recurrent allergy and needs. Uh, Serum Ig is a sophisticated eosinophilia. 
and erosion of data is useless, so it's sophisticatedly useless. <laughs> I, I don't think we should waste time in doing that at all. It's almost like a CRP. I'm sure now people do CRP instead of ESR. CRP is ESR for those who have to spend more money for same interpretation. And I think barring exception, these are all useless tests. I don't think you should go by serum IG at all. If you want to convince somebody that he has an allergy, serum IG. But for all that you know, not every time an allergy is IgE mediated. Allergy could be IgG mediated or an IgA mediated. And therefore, I think the diagnosis of asthma is clinical. And not even, I won't worry greatly. Serum IG is useless. Eosinophilia does not make any big difference. But yes, eosinophilia is often an accompanying feature. I think this is going to be one of your favorite questions, sir. When to suspect only eosinophilia? <laughs> I wish I knew that because I said loudly, I haven't seen one. Okay. But typically, a, a child who looks like a syndrome of asthma but has never had any asthmatic episode before or a golden cup, not family history or person history of atopy has a severe eosinophilia. And by severe eosinophilia, we know that an absolute eosinophil count more than three times. And therefore, that kind of an eosinophilia, looking like an asthma syndrome but never before, without an allergy history, may be a tropical eosinophilia. You might have also a hepatosclerosmegaly and other things. I, I know that adults do see at times. But typically, tropical eosinophilia is due to a filarial annotation. And I think that's where the dietal carbamazine has come in. And I feel it's probably extremely rare. The next question, honey is said to be as effective as dextromethorphan. How much honey should you use? I think uh, all these cough syrups are equally useless. <laughs> so, having said that, you still need to use that. Why do you need to use that? Because it could be occasionally useful. And you must give a try. See, if the parents haven't slept the whole night, and you can't tell them, go on, okay. I'm sure if a, if a doctor's child is coughing, he needs a relief. And I suppose so, therefore, it's our duty to try to offer relief, but not guarantee relief. So when I see such a bad cough, I say, this is going to take two weeks, but I will try my best to give comfort to the child and the parents, and the comfort is only a single dose at that time, and we'll try this, if not, let's try something else. That means you are very clear to say that this is not a final recipe. Generally what happens is, if you tell them you will try this medicine, if not, there are many other medicines. So that after two weeks anyway that cough starts and your last medicine works, as I said. And therefore, all, all that means is, pick up anything. Each one of us has some experience of some drug working or not working. I think we should go by that. But none of us can boast to say, this works and this doesn't work. It's only a question of safety and a benefit accrued to an individual child. Salbutamol or terbutaline, which is safer and the better bronchodilator? I think both are safe. But you know today that many companies shifted from salbutamol to terbutaline only because the government of India brought a control on the price of salbutamol. And there is no control on terbutamol. <laughs> now, if I am the manufacturer and I have changed from salbutamol to terbutamol, I must come and tell you why I have done it. And I say, uh, the research tells salbutamol is a little better drug. And what is better drug? 2 mg of salbutamol is equivalent to 1.5 mg of terbutamol. But both have 1 teaspoon same, no? What milligrams to go by? And therefore, I think both are absolutely same. Many times the industry plays up with this for varieties of other reasons and makes us feel that this is all scientifically based. Both are same, both are equal, both have the same problem and both have the same benefits. Monty Lucas, safety and how long can it be given in pediatric? Monty Lucas is never a drug of first choice in asthma, at least in pediatric practice. I don't know about adults. And therefore, inhaled corticosteroid is the drug of choice. But the problem with us is that we want to sell our idea and not promote our science. So when I tell the parents you have child has asthma, they say asthma? Oh, you are wrong. Whole generations have had no asthma. So they go to somebody else and he says, what asthma? This is simply allergic bronchitis. So we start using such terms. 
Then when I say inhaled corticosteroid, first is inhaler is bad. In Bombay Times edition, I'm sure everywhere, Dr. Batra gives an advertisement, a homeopath, to say, are you going to give this toy inhaler in the hands of your child, which can kill your child? No. Because uh, many other pathways have no control on even advertisements. And therefore, parents, parents don't want inhaler, and they don't want corticosteroids at all. They don't mind urine therapy, and what works in urine therapy is a steroid. Why take steroid in that form? Uh, you have a better uh, palatable steroid. But, therefore, therefore, we shy away from the scientific fact. And that's where the Monte Luca variety. In the West, it's very commonly used. But today, science knows that that's not the best drug. So, it is a drug inferior, but easy to convince people. Take it orally, why take inhaler? People think inhaler forms a habit. Inhaler is a container. Contains the same as serine steroid. And I tell the parent that if you start drinking liquor in a teacup, you will still get addicted. Don't go by the teacup. Inhaler is a container, not a container. But the parents ask me, will you form a habit? Now, if you are told right from the childhood, don't eat two times a day meals, because you will form a habit and whole life long you will have to eat twice. So that's not a habit, that's a need. And therefore, I think Montelukas to me is an inferior drug. It's an add-on drug, selectively, for a very small percentage of patients, maybe 5%. So to me, Montelukas is nearly never used, and not to be used as an isolated single drug of choice. Though some literature can come up to say, oh, this also works. Uh, but I'm sure science does not accept. The child with a thick, purulent nasal discharge without fever on day 5, should, does the child need antibiotics? I think if it's a greenish, foul-smelling discharge, you know that he's suffering a chronic infection, and chronic infection may not have high fever. But just because it's thick, or it's just because it's yellowish, don't rush in to him. The most important thing is that, if you are not sure whether this is an indication for an antibiotic or not, the first thing you need to be sure is, what happens if you waited for two days? And in this situation, nothing will go wrong even if you wait for two days. But in the next two days, you will start running fever. And you would know that, oh, you could have prescribed antibiotic two days earlier. It would not make a difference. So I think you will need to tell the parent that, I think this could be a bacterial infection, but I am not sure because your child has no fever. But let's wait on. Maybe in the next two days you will get better. If you get better, there is no question. If not, then we we'll look after it. But during which time, nothing will go wrong with your child. I think parents want safety to be assured. And most of the parents don't love drugs anyway. So, it will be a good combination to assure them it is safe to wait without drug. And still keep it open. And use a drug if you are proved that, yes, it was a bacteria. I think your comparison of the elephant, the cow and the goat has affected someone. He has sent us a question. How do you diagnose primary complex in kids? Uh, primary complex is not an easy diagnosis. And therefore, again, uh, where is the urgency to diagnose? Only in a child under one or two years. Beyond that, there is no urgency at all. It's like a small lymph node. Primary complex is the lymph node in the mediastinum, in the lung. But even a cervical lymph node is the primary complex. Suppose I see a small lymph node there. I'm not sure what it is. Do I do a FNAC, a biopsy, a man to a chest x-ray? No, I would go clinically and say, let's wait. If it is increasing, if there is a contact, if there is a circumstantial evidence, yes. Point is that we should not shy away from saying, today I don't know what is the diagnosis, but I know two things. I know there is no harm at all waiting, and I know how to know tomorrow. I think if we need to tell that, parents will accept it. But we are afraid that how can I say I don't know? As you get senior, now today when I tell the parent, I don't know the diagnosis. Oh, they laugh and they say, oh, this is your modesty. What modesty? It's a truth. <laughs> but to a junior person, that might harm. No, no, it won't harm. You need to tell them that many diseases evolve over time. And I tell them that if there is a lot of clouds in the sky, it doesn't mean you open an umbrella. It may not rain. It may clear. When will you know? Only time. There are many diseases which evolve over time. And waiting is safe. I would wait for it to evolve, and the treatment is not longer because if I waited few days. Treatment is same, outcome is same, benefit is same, no risk at all. 
all that you know, this lipid may disappear or will never in that. Why do that? And therefore, I think you'll have to take it clinically. Point that I'm making is don't rush to a laboratory to prove a diagnosis unless you are suspected. Because if a clinician is not sure, even laboratory results will have difficulty in interpretation. And a mantra test doesn't mean you have TB anyway. And a mantra negative also doesn't mean you have ruled out TB. So there are problems and we need to look at very, very correctly, not in a hurry. I think learn to say I don't know. But to say that it's safe to wait and it's also that I will know tomorrow. And I think if you say that, most of the parents would accept it. Antibiotics are frequently used logically to prevent secondary bacterial infections. Whether this statement holds good, is there any evidence? To my mind, secondary bacterial infections are not common. TB does not have a secondary bacterial infection. Many viral infections may not have a secondary bacterial infection, though some of them, like say measles, okay, which is quite an immunosuppressive disease, may have a secondary bacterial infection. And how do you know that when it starts happening? So a child of measles gets better, the rash comes out, fever should have gone away, and the fever persists. I know that probably something is happening. So there are clues. So secondary infection is an intelligent clinician's defense to write a prescription of an antibiotic. And therefore antibiotics are written in three situations, but you need to justify. One, if the bacterial infection is justified. If it's a viral infection, you convince a parent to prevent secondary infection. And if there is no infection, you call it prophylactic antibiotic. So, <laughs> antibiotic can be given to everyone. The question is how convincing you are to write that. Writing is easy, convincing. And I think the only way you can be rational is put down three lines why you wrote an antibiotic. If you cannot put down those three lines, then I think you are not justified. The X-ray report comes with a ten lines and then a conclusion. A laboratory report comes full page. And a clinician report, none at all. Name of the patient and drugs. That's not a report. If you start writing a key three line reason for your diagnosis and prescription, I think we will improve our rationality. I think we must all appreciate the way Dr. Ambedkar answered those queries. And uh, they are actually FAQs. I mean, frequently asked questions by pediatricians. Thank you very much, sir, for answering those questions.